Let the church say amen again. Amen. What a blessing it is to be in the house of God on this morning. We acknowledge that he has done all things well, and it is because of his grace, and it's because of his mercy, and it is because of his goodness that we are here. And so we acknowledge him. And before we ask anything, Amen. we have come as a church to say thank you. God is good this morning. Amen. People often say he's not good some of the time. God is good all the time. Amen. And I believe we say that because that is true. We would not have the breath that we breathe if it were not for God. We appreciate your presence on this morning. We are thankful that you have decided to be with us. If you are visiting with us, know that you are our honored guest. And there may be those of you who are traveling. We bid you uh, safe travel and we will pray for you uh, that you make it back to your destination safely. Uh, we appreciate the songs that have been sang. Brother Sarpy always does an outstanding job. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sign when you forget you have to preach. <laughs> you sing it <laughs> and you forget. You say, oh, is that, I, oh, okay. <laughs> when, the, when the singing is that good. Uh, amen. So we appreciate him and we appreciate all of the other brothers who have joined in in making sure that our worship service has been edified. We appreciate the prayers that have been prayed. We appreciate the scripture reading. We appreciate all parts of our worship. Uh, we're dealing with living singles. Amen. See, I'm not single. So uh, I struggle. I struggle with, with, uh, with sermons that deal with being single. I left that behind me. Amen, Sister Gibbs. <laughs> but I'll say this. We have an amazing group of singles that work tirelessly uh, shoulder to shoulder on behalf of the kingdom, specifically the work that is being done here at Greenville Avenue. And so uh, this series, we dealt with uh, single and complete. Brother Worthy did an outstanding job. Amen. 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 And then Brother Bradshaw uh, came behind him and, and, and did an outstanding job working for the Lord, was on last week. And this morning, I'm going to speak from the subject of waiting on the Lord. And so I want you to know from the outset that if you are single and uh, you are a Christian, that you have something far better than a spouse. Amen. And I love my spouse. Amen. I love my spouse. So, it's, so me saying that is saying something, but Peter tells us that, that we have obtained a like Precious faith. So if you will, study with me this morning. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. And y'all can smile. Smile. Amen. You say, well, if you smile, I'll smile. Back at you. I'm going to smile in a minute. It's been a long week, y'all. <laughs> Give me time. Amen. Peter writes. He says, Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith. Can y'all say precious faith? precious faith? With us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to look at this subject of waiting on the Lord from three uh, vantage points. And the first is... I want to show you that there is a reason for our waiting. There's a reason that we wait. And then point number two, I want to show you that, that Peter gives a recipe for waiting. A young man, it's going to be a quiz after the sermon, so make sure y'all writing these down. Number one is a reason for waiting. Amen. Number two is a recipe for waiting. And then number three is the reward for waiting. So let's look at point number one. First of all, what I want you to understand is that, is that Peter 
is talking to a group of Christians who are suffering. These individuals are distressed. They are being oppressed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. There's a reoccurring theme throughout these two letters. And I'm talking about first and second Peter, where Peter is referring or he is referencing this, this, this idea of suffering, of being persecuted, of being oppressed. You got to see that these individuals are not having a easy time. And the reason they're not having an easy time is because they are Christians. Amen. Because they have named the name of Christ. I want you to see that, that 15 times that Peter is, is, is dealing with these individuals and talking about their suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1, if you put that on the board, Peter begins this letter in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. He begins this letter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. Amen. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the what? To the strangers, to the scattered throughout Asia. He lists those names, but that's not important for the point that I'm trying to make. He says that these individuals are strangers. It reminds me of what you read about in Nazi Germany, where you have individuals who who because they are Jews, they had a home, but, but because of oppression, because of opposition, they have been what? They have become strangers. In Nazi concentration camps, they are, they are scattered throughout Germany. Why? Because they are Jews. And so what you have to see is that these Christians are in the same boat. They are strangers. They are, they are scattered. Why? Because they are Christians. Peter does his best to encourage them in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 6. What does the Bible say? We're going to put that on the board. He says, wherein ye what? Greatly rejoice. Though now for what? Though now for what? A season, if need be, you are in what? Heaviness through manifold temptations. The NIV says it differently. It says, if you suffer grief in all kinds of trials, that's what was happening to these individuals. They were suffering grief because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Scholars point to this time period when this letter was written and they talk about the social discrimination that these Christians had to face. They talk about prosecution. They were prosecuted. Why? Because they stole something? No. They were prosecuted because of their faith in the risen Savior. They were executed. Historians talk about how Nero, the emperor during this time, he would, he would sick dogs on Christians and those dogs would tear apart their flesh. And then he would take the flesh and dip it in tar and create lamps by burning human flesh. What are you saying? I'm saying that these individuals, they were suffering. And why were they suffering? They were suffering because they were Christians. Here's my question. My question is, what was the reason? 
What was the reason that they would hold fast to their faith? Jesus had died. They didn't have any allegiance to, to, to someone who had died, amen? You're going you gonna to let yourself be killed? Prosecuted? You're looking at the people around you and you see cousins, friends, Because of their faith in Jesus Christ being killed, dying horrible deaths. Why? Why would you? Would any of us do that? Now I'm going to get to my text. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. I want to show you that they have had attained, obtained something that was worthy of what they went through. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained what? They have obtained like precious faith. Here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine a black velvet box and inside this box is a ring and it's a beautiful diamond ring that represents or symbolizes precious faith. Metaphorically, I want you to imagine that God himself put a ring on your finger. And that ring that he put on your finger is your faith. And that, and that faith is valuable. It's valuable. Peter calls it precious. Somebody ought to ask me, why is it valuable? Why is it precious? Well, he tells us. He says, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the what? Through the what? Come on, church. Through the what? Through the righteousness of God. In other words, the ring that is on your finger, young man, the ring that is on your finger, it represents something, and it represents the righteousness of God. In other words, God did not just subtract your sins he added righteousness the bible says therefore being justified by faith somebody ought to say amen we have we have what we have peace with god why do we have peace with god it's because you have a ring on your finger and that ring is your faith see see we could not approach god but that ring represents the righteousness of, of God that allows me to come boldly before God. See, I couldn't come before God before I received this faith. Not only that, when you look at the text, the Bible says that that ring also represents something else. Verse number two, what does the Bible say? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the what? Through the knowledge of God. In other words, the ring that is on your finger, it represents the what? The knowledge of Almighty God. In other words, I know who God is. I know that God is trustworthy because of the ring that I have on my finger. All scripture is inspired by God. I can look all the way back and know who God is. And I can know that as I move into the future, because of the faith that I have, because of the ring that's on my finger, that God is trustworthy. And then not only that. In verse number four. That ring represents something else. Watch what the Bible says. Whereby. Are given unto us. Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might what? Y'all see that? Exceeding. Great. And precious, what? 
That ring represents God's promises. I want you to see this morning that we serve a God that has put a ring on our finger. Sometimes singles say, well, you can't die without having a ring on your finger. What I want you to understand is that, that, that God has already put a ring on your finger. If you have been baptized into Christ, you have received the righteousness of God. You have received the knowledge of God. You have received the promises of God. And when I think about this, those individuals during this time that Peter was writing to, despite the persecution, they would not allow anyone to take that ring off. Nobody was going to take that ring off. That ring was something that, that only God could give. No man could give you what God has given you and despite the persecution, despite everything that was going on, there was no way that suffering was going to keep them from what? From removing that ring. Point number two. Not only is there a reason for waiting, but I want to show you that there is a recipe for waiting. When you look at this text, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5, Peter says there's something that you have to add to this faith. There's something that goes with this faith. Peter wants to know that if God puts a ring on your finger, he expects something from us. Do we just sit and wait for Jesus to return? No, sir. He says, as we wait, there are some things that we have to add. Look at the text, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. Look at what Peter says. He says, and besides this, giving all what? giving all diligence add to your what how do we wait we wait by adding to our faith we don't just sit on our hands amen as we wait we do what we add to our faith he said with all diligence add to your faith what he says add to your faith virtue and then he says add to virtue knowledge and to knowledge, what else? Temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, what? Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love or charity. I only have time to deal with virtue. But I think virtue is enough. When you look at the, not enough in terms of not adding the rest of them, but enough in terms of the time that I have will be well spent if I only deal with virtue. Amen. What is virtue? Virtue or virtuous comes from a Greek word, chael. Chael means power. It means force. It means strength of Conviction. That's virtuous. The word virtue comes from a Greek word already, which means it serves its intended purpose. I told the earlier service, and I probably shouldn't have, but I'll tell you too, is that my wife has a um, luxury vehicle. And, you know, when you hit the gas, it goes. The idea during this time, during this Roman period, was that the word virtue meant excellence. It's the idea that something serves its intended 
purpose. It's a tool. And when that tool works effectively, when that tool does what it's supposed to do, it's virtuous. When I hit that gas, I can tell that the engineers, they designed that vehicle in a way that it intended for you to feel it, amen. <laughs> it also carries, and I'm talking about virtue and virtuous. It also carries the idea of a soldier who is in battle, who stands firm. A soldier who stands firm. In other words, the soldier, despite an oncoming onslaught, he's not backing up. The soldier, he what? He stands firm. When I think about, when I think about this idea, this idea inspires me. It inspires me. And you know why it inspires me? It inspires me because there are a lot of us who have not added virtue. See, see, it's one thing to have faith. But your faith means nothing. Amen, walls and lights. It means nothing if you don't stand firm. If you don't stand on the righteousness of God, your faith means nothing. If you don't stand firm, I'm, I'm sorry about yelling at y'all, but watch this. If you do not stand firm on the knowledge of God, you know what God said, but if you don't stand firm on it, you know what God has promised, but do you believe? Are we willing to stand firm? What are you talking about, Brother Gibbs? I'm talking about standing firm. Can y'all say stand firm? Stand firm. Oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> y'all not serious. But we about to get serious. Amen. Amen. You can smile. You can smile. Let's try it again. Stand firm. Stand firm. That's a little bit better. We're going to work with you. Amen. Amen. We're going to work on it. We're going to work on it. All right. Look at Proverbs 31 and verse number 10. Proverbs 31 and verse number 10. It carries, it carries the same idea, but it goes a little bit deeper. And it, and, it, and it looks at it from the standpoint of being trustworthy. A soldier that stands firm is what? He is, he is trustworthy. Amen. Bible says, who can find a what? Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a woman that stands firm? For her price is far above what? Rubies. Verse number 11. The heart of her husband doth what? Doth safely trust in her. Why does his heart safely trust in her? Because she stands firm. I remember when Francine and I were dating. She's from Kentucky. I'm from this area, Terrell, Texas. Hey, man. <laughs> and so when she graduated from college she moved to Texas Now she comes from a family great family great family close family she loves her family they love her she's a she's a daddy's mama's grandmama's aunties uncles she's everybody's baby amen it's the truth but she had enough faith in me. She had enough faith in me that she moved all the way where she was from, left all that she had, and moved here to Texas. 
Well, there was a period that I was unemployed. And she didn't leave me. She could have gone back home. There was a period that I took the bar. She married a lawyer or somebody that was supposed to be a lawyer. Amen. <laughs> there was a period that I took the bar and I failed. You can't get a job as a lawyer if you don't pass the bar. And you know what she did? She stayed with me. There was a period of time where it was three of us. Myself, Francine, and little Shelton in a one-bedroom apartment. We couldn't go out to eat. When we go to Kentucky, we eat out every day. I mean, every day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't even eat that much. But that's what she was used to. But you know what she did? She, she stayed with me. She didn't go back home. I'm sure there were those in her family that said, you can do better. Have y'all seen my wife? My wife is a very attractive woman. She was not hurting. What my looks? Amen. You don't clap on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's ugly. That's ugly. Not me, you. <laughs> I'm joking. But my point is, is that I know her family had to have thought you can do better. But she stood how? She stood firm. Singles, married folk, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that God put a ring on your finger. Everything that God has been doing from, since the beginning of time, his righteousness, you possess his righteousness. You possess the word of God. Why? Because he inspired it. You possess the promises of God. He put the ring on your finger to remind you that he is yours. And you are his. And that ring is precious faith. Here's my question. Can God trust you? Can God trust you? No, I'm asking. Can God trust you? When we don't have the money in the bank account, and the collection plate comes around. Can God trust you? When it's raining outside. Or it's cold. And God says forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Can God trust you? Here's what I want you to see. Is that there were those. There were those in times of old. That God trusted he trusted people what an amazing concept that the God of heaven the creator of all things he he trusts a man he trusted Noah he said there's nobody like him when he decided to destroy the world and and he needed somebody who feared him to the point that they would follow his instructions. He found a man that was virtuous. You know who else God trusted? God trusted a man by the name of Job. The Bible says that Satan was walking up and down the earth minding his own business. He not thinking about Job. But you know what? Job's virtue caught God's attention. And he said, he said, say, I'm sorry. He said, hey, <laughs> Satan, come here, come here, come here, come here. What you been doing? I've been going up and down the earth. There's a man who is virtuous. He is upright. He is showing evil. 
Have you considered him? Considered him for what? I want you to try him. I want you to see if he'll stand firm. Look what Satan said. Satan said, does he not have reason to fear you? You got a hedge around him. Everything he touches, you bless. The man is rich because of you. He said, he said, take the hedge around him. Let me touch him. Let him suffer. And he will curse you to your face. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, he's saying, if he suffers, he'll take the ring off. God trusted Job. I think about what Peter is trying to help them appreciate. And the lesson is almost short. I'm almost finished. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. He says, be sober. Put it up in the NIV. He says, be sober. Be vigilant. Did I? First, first Peter 5 and verse number 8. Okay. You guys have it. In the NIV. It doesn't matter. He says, be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may what? Devour. Look at verse number nine. Watch what he says. He says, I know that you received this precious faith. I know that you are, are suffering persecution. I know that Nero is coming after you. He says, but resist him. Stand how? Stand how? Stand firm where? He says, stand firm in the what? In the faith. My last point, and I'm closing. We've looked at the reason. We've looked at the recipe, but there's a reward for waiting. I know, I know it is tempting. It is tempting to back up. You look at all the world has to offer. Amen. Our kids get ostracized. Oh, you a holy roller? You think homosexuality is wrong? There's some things we're doing that are unheard of. Amen. And if you speak up against it, Amen. you get canceled. Oh, you judging me? See, 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 it is a challenge, especially in this day and time. To, to wait on the Lord with virtue. Why? Because everything we do is countercultural. But there's a reward for waiting. God needs us to stand firm. You know, you know, let me say it this way. The only way that you become useful. The only way that you become useful to God. See, you are no use to God. God cannot use you if you don't stand firm. What did, what did you just say, Brother Gibbs? I said that God cannot use you if you will not stand firm. What did you just say, Brother Gibbs? I just said God cannot use you if you do not stand firm. He can't use you. You ever had a noodle? Well, have you ever had a piece of spaghetti that was uncooked? You know, you could, you could, I mean, it's not good for much, but you could take that noodle and you could push something with it. But you boil that noodle. Boil that noodle. See, some of us are noodles. God can't fight with a noodle. He can't fight with a noodle. Every time he tries to stand you up, foam. Look at what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 8. He says, for if these things be in you and about, if what things be in you? 
what he asked you to add, all seven of those principles. He said, but I'm just talking about virtue. Just start with virtue. If virtue be in you, if just, just, just virtue, if you just add virtue to your faith, he said, you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I think about being useful, God could fight with Abraham because Abraham waited with virtue. He had a wife that was old and barren. Yet when God made a promise to him, he waited 25 more years. He stood firm in his waiting. What did he stand on? The promises of God. Joseph, he was useful to God. Why was he useful? This is a man that was sold into slavery. A man who was lied on. 13 years he spent in captivity. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. But yet he stood firm in obedience. He said, I ain't doing that to God. How can I? The God who blessed me. Caleb and Joshua, all of the others when they were sent to spy out the land of Canaan, the land that flowed with milk and honey, they came back and they said, 10 of them came back and said, we, we are like grasshoppers, the, the, the children of, what's his name? Yeah, say, say that again. Yeah, amen. <laughs> There's no way we can fight against them. Caleb steal the people. See, you can fight with Caleb. God can fight with Caleb. He said, we be able. <laughs> Let us go up at once. They are bread. Why? Because I'm not strong, but the God that I serve is strong. Is there somebody this morning who believes that God can do what you cannot do? God rewards our faith. I'm telling you this morning that there is not a door that I have walked through that God did not open. I was not looking to be a judge. God, God sent me to be a judge. I know you think that sounds funny, but I wasn't asking to do that. I did not ask to come to Greenville Avenue as, as, as great as everybody is. This is my home church, but I was not looking to come here. I walked through this door because God opened it. And people say this, people say this, people say, well, Shelton, you can't preach the way that you preach and be a judge. You can't go into court talking about the husband is the head of the wife. And Amen. See, see, I would be concerned about that if I thought that, that I opened the door myself. See, 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 I, I'm not trying to impress y'all. I can use whatever kind of language, ain't, or whatever I want to in the pulpit because it's not about, it's not about anybody but about God. Amen. And my job, my role, my role as a minister is to preach truth. Amen. And if God closes that door of judge, he opened it. If God closes this door, he opened it. I'm not trying to stay anywhere that I'm not wanted. Amen, walls and life. But anywhere that God sends me, my goal is to be useful. How, how, how can you be useful, Shelton? You can be useful by standing firm. Just do what he told you to do. Don't worry about it. nothing is too big. Nothing is too small. But when I get there, don't act like you don't know me. You give me a broom, I know how to sweep. God wants some sweepers. God wants some individuals that are willing to stand on his promises. Are willing to stand on his word. You can trust him. You can trust him. 
Stand on his righteousness. You don't have a righteousness apart from God. I'm talking about virtue. Virtue is not righteousness. Virtue is standing firm. The righteousness that you have is God's righteousness. I'm closing. Actually, I have to close. I had more, but I think that's it. Yes, 40 minutes. Amen. Trying to think of the most important things I can say out of all that I have left. Let me encourage you to be noticeably different. God needs his children to be countercultural. Not going with the flow, not doing and looking and dressing and acting like everybody else and accepting everything. He needs his people to be his people. He put a ring on your finger. Singles, he put a ring on your finger and don't take it off. Married folk, he put a ring on your finger and despite the challenges, don't take it off. Trust God. Jesus stood firm on the cross and God highly exalted him. And he's asking us to do the same. Stand firm for me. And if we do, we'll be a church that will change the world. He doesn't need a whole lot of folk. He just, need, he just needs a few that are willing to stand firm. Amen. He doesn't need everybody. This is a, most of the people in this audience are not willing to stand firm. He just needs a few. Will you be, will you be a part of the few that will grow this church by standing firm? You come to Jesus. By hearing his word, believing with all of your heart, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ to be the son of the living God, being willing to go down with him Amen. in the watery grave of baptism, that puts you into Christ, that puts the ring on your finger, that puts the, the righteousness of God that covers you, it, it, it gives you access to, to a perspective that comes from the knowledge of God, it gives you the promises of God, they're yours, you believe in God also believe in me and my father's house. There are, not, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I promise I'm coming back to receive you into myself. You're going to die. You're going to die. And all of the stuff that you've accumulated Amen. is not coming with you. They wouldn't take off the ring because they understood that there's a bigger picture, there's a bigger perspective, and they had something that God could not give, and that is eternal life. Come to Jesus. As together we stand and sing, will you come? Careless soul, why will you linger, wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation. Is there oh, one? He the warning. Is there one this morning? For your life. He wants to bless you. Will soon be gone. Will soon be gone. Oh, how sad. Oh, how to face the judgment. We'll wait on you. We'll wait on you. Come to Jesus. Unprepared Is there one this morning? Who wants to put a ring on? My God. Why so thoughtless are you standing while I hear Jesus saying, Come to me. By, and your I hear Jesus is saying, There's a man who hears the sayings of mine to me and does them. He's like a man who built his house. Up on a rock. Oh, he the warning. When the rain the winds come, oh, your house will stand. But I hear Jesus also saying that a man who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not is like a man who built his house up on the sand. When the winds and the rain come, that house will not stand. It will fall. And great will be the destruction. To Come to Jesus. He loves you. Oh, okay.
Judgment. 